Hello, listeners. Jordan here. I just want to let you know that you can listen to Nighttime early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Include it with Prime. Before we begin the episode, I want to call out to an anonymous tipster. After releasing the prior episode in the Sia Van Wick series, I received an anonymous message from an insider with information related to Sia's case, specifically information related to something that was alleged to have happened at a hospital. Your tip may be more important than you know, but you didn't provide any way for me to contact you for clarification. So if you're hearing this, please contact me again. I'll keep your information strictly confidential. Please reach out to me using the links at nighttimepodcast.com dot com slash contact. Now let's get to the episode. You are listening to the Nighttime Podcast. Hello listeners, and welcome back to my multi-part series covering the death of then seven-year-old Sia Van Wick. So far in this series, we met Sia's family, learned a lot about the man driving the tractor, and were given a front row seat to the investigation carried out both by police and private investigator Tom Martin. During the multiple episodes you've heard so far, there's been a few common threads of discussion. One of them being that the initial investigation into Sia's death was objectively flawed. And as a result, her chance at justice seemed to also die in that madman's field. Well, the uphill battle for justice for Sia is what we're going to be exploring tonight. In this episode, we're going to take a seat at the office of the man representing Sia's family, trial lawyer James Giacomantonio. Let's get into it. Seven-year-old Sia Vanwick was full of life and adventure. She was playing in a neighbor's hayfield in Clementsvale near Digby on July 19th when she was struck by a piece of farm machinery. Sia died hours later from her injuries. James, I'm ignorant on the different types of law and lawyers. There's all these different versions of lawyers. What exactly do you do? What is your role in the? So I am. Uh, I'm a part of a small law firm that brands ourselves as trial lawyers, but effectively, my specialty is criminal defense, with a subspecialty of administrative law. Basically. I'm able to go to any court and argue for a client. Okay, so you are one of the lawyers that are actually standing there talking, pleading a case. Yeah, an old-fashioned, yeah, trial lawyer. Okay. Barrister, they sometimes call them. How did you come to work with the Van Wick family? So this is an American family who has a tragedy in Nova Scotia. How do they how do they end up with you? How do they come to you? So they were referred to me in pretty early in my private practice career. So my first career was as a prosecutor. I did that for about nine years. Mm -hmm. Just a little more than nine years. I was a a prosecutor here in Nova Scotia, both in Cape Breton and in Halifax and uh, in Dartmouth, which Mm -hmm. is uh, where I work now. And I left the prosecution service to start this law firm. And one of my first referrals was this client. I'm not sure quite where they got my name or from whom, but they were looking for someone who had prosecution experience because this is not a typical criminal defense case. Mm where they're looking for me to defend an allegation that they say is false. They're looking for my help. They were looking for my help to prosecute a case that had not yet been prosecuted. Okay, so just as from what you've said already, it seems like you have experiences on both sides as a defense and a prosecutor. Absolutely. Um, Now, when someone is referred to you or someone calls you looking for help, I assume you don't take on every case that comes to you and there must be some kind of vetting process what about the Van Wicks made you say, like, yeah, I'm going to get behind this? Well, actually, at first, and I don't think I've told them this, at first I was a little cautious because there was so much pain. You know, mm-hmm. I talked to the parents, um, Effie and Eric, and just every time we would discuss what happened to their daughter, it was just so painful. There was a lot of tears and long conversations, just expressing frustration with the process. And sometimes people who have that much pain are just difficult to work with. Uh, and, you know, I didn't know what had happened. So mm-hmm. eventually um, they sent me some information about the case and they persuaded me that there was something to look into here. And for me, um, while I may be a criminal defense lawyer and some people may have a sense that that means I'm not for justice, that's mm-hmm. not the case. Mm-hmm. I believe very strongly in the justice system. And uh, while I have left the prosecution service, I, I am committed absolutely to justice. And this case was obvious it was, it was very obvious to me that what had happened here 
had deprived this family of their access access to justice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as I sit in your office, I'm seeing you know number one dad type drawings. Uh, I'm guessing you have a family. Did that does that play into it at all? Like, do you as I know as a father myself, when I get into a story like this, it just it hits differently. How does that affect you? Yeah, even as you're asking the question, I'm getting a little emotional. I have three daughters. Uh, who uh, and a son my, my children are ages 8 through 11 right now mm -hmm. but at the time that I took this case on they were probably 4, 5, 6, 7 okay. and um, so the idea of a young girl getting killed and the effect that would have on a family uh, is hit very close to home yeah, when you, at the point that you become involved in this there has already been uh, like I'm using air quotes like an official investigation with a decision made that it was accidental in nature when you first get involved, what is it that they're coming to you with? Like, what is your goal or what are you working towards? They brought, they brought with them, and I could be corrected because it was five years ago yeah. when I first met them, and I've now I've become immersed in the case. Um, but when they first approached me, I believe they had a redacted version of the initial police investigation, which they had to fight for through their civil lawyer because there was a wrongful death lawsuit. And so they weren't given access to the information. They were treated unfairly. And so they had, I guess, some information about what they believed the police knew and didn't know. Um, but it was only the bare bones. It wasn't a full understanding of what happened, which they, and they were convinced that the police had investigated it. And my experience as a prosecutor and as a criminal defense lawyer is that police are human beings and sometimes they don't do a good job. And um, that's just the nature of, of all human experience, I guess, to be broad about it. But I felt that they had something that needed some work, they needed some closure. Mm -hmm. And so I reviewed the information they provided me and we started working on the case. Yeah. Uh, did, did you know of Sia's death in the, in the story before hearing from them? Or did you, you know, get this call and start, you know, Googling? No, I, I had heard it before. I didn't put two and two together until they told me and then they mentioned there'd been a National Post story. And then I, and I, oh. and then I was like, oh my goodness, that case. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I recall from talking to, uh, more so in my discussion with Effie, she talked about getting very little information from the police and using the civil suit almost as a strategy to get more access. So you would have gotten involved after that had yes. already started, but before Tom Martin's report, which I think really blows it open. That's correct, yeah. So they come, they'd come to me without enough information, and I said, well, based on what we have, we just don't know enough. And you guys weren't there. We know Eric was nearby and Effie was in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I, ha I knew Tom Martin um, from my days as a prosecutor and had a great deal of respect for him. Mm -hmm. And as criminal defense lawyers, we need to have access to investigators to privately, privately investigate cases and take statements and do things like this. So I called Tom, who I knew had the expertise. And you know he's a, someone who, on top of having the, the police experience, has farming experience. Yeah as a family yeah. and he was very eager to get started so uh, we brought Tom in pretty quickly because we wanted to discuss how and what he could bring to the table so we could get justice for Sierra. So Tom gets involved, he agrees to take it on, he completes his investigation and hands off the report to you and the Van Wicks. What was that moment like? Because I know as myself outside, as an outsider, when I read Tom's report, it seems like a clear cut case of wrongdoing. You as a lawyer, when you get that report from him and see his findings, how did, how did you feel? Well, I think he was able to substantiate what we had always believed, was that, which is that the investigation was inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, I think that at least can be agreed upon. And at some point, I don't know if it'll ever end up in the public in any form bigger than this podcast. Mm -hmm. But I think there, was, there were just investigative leads that weren't, that weren't tracked down. As Tom has said... You know, the idea that a piece of Sia's flesh was left behind in the field mm -hmm. only to be discovered the next day and not collected mm -hmm. by the police as evidence is just, it really hurt him, I think, mm -hmm. as a former police officer. And he knew that that wasn't good enough. And so when we finally got the report and one of his investigators had managed to actually speak with, with Roland Potter and extract information from Roland about what he had known about Sia and mm -hmm. her presence on the field, that changed the water on the beans because one of the problems with this police investigation is that they never actually targeted Roland Potter as a suspect. Mm -hmm. So they never gave him appropriate warnings and cautions. So as they were gathering information the night of the uh, incident and the next morning when they came to take some aerial photographs and meet with him, they didn't give him the police warning that he was a suspect and he had the right to silence or the right to a, 
a lawyer, and he wasn't being treated as a suspect. So they almost inadvertently gathered information that we say, and Tom um, expanded on, showing that he knew what was going on, that he had seen Sia, and that potentially there was always this overture that he was drinking mm-hmm. at the time, which of course can't be proven. Mm-hmm. And so when what I told the family is that the what he had told the investigators about being on the field and running her over, that might not be admissible against him because in Canada, police have to give a warning. Mm-hmm. People have a right to silence. Mm-hmm. And so without that information, we really didn't know a lot about what happened because there was only Sia and Roland Potter. Mm-hmm. So when one of Tom's investigators was able to get essentially a confession that he had seen Sia on the field for at least two minutes and that she was chasing behind him and he was concerned yet did nothing. Mm-hmm. I think I, I, for, for me, that was a watershed moment. Mm-hmm. And I said in my final report, in my opinion, which I provided the family, that's the lin- linchpin piece of evidence. Mm-hmm. That puts him in reasonable knowledge of Sia's where, uh, whereabouts and the risk that he posed to her, which he expressed to everyone. He knew that it was a danger, that, that she shouldn't have been on the field, yet he did nothing to, to stop or to get her off the field or to ensure that she was in safety before continuing. And ultimately, we know that he, he operated the tractor and ran her over. So that admission was crucial. That was, a, that was um, excellent. Yeah, and, it, and, it's, and it's, if, he had a set, if Roland Potter had said that to the police prior, it couldn't be used because he wasn't read the, his appropriate rights or whatever? I, it, a court of law would have decided whether he was being voluntary, but there was a real argument. If I was his lawyer in this case, mm-hmm. I would have tried to make a motion to exclude all of the statements to the police. Yeah. Tom, and I just want to expand on my last answer because I think I missed, also Tom expanded. He went to the scene. He took photographs and, and aerials and, and measured the, they didn't even measure the size of the field or her height or how high the grass was. He went back on the same day the next year, like exactly the same day, exact same time yeah. to measure light levels, who would have been visible, et cetera. So this is all work that wasn't done by the police. So by the end of Tom's report, we have a sense of, her position, when she, the, the body position of Sia when she was actually struck by the tractor and the, the visibility which Mr. Potter would claim that she was invisible but we know what clothes she was wearing, we know how tall she was mm-hmm. and all of the measurements were, were critical to understanding what he likely would have been able to see and observe had he been, um, had he been doing, had he been careful or prudent. So much of the work that needs to be done now legally is correcting the mistakes or things that were missed in the early days. So let me ask you that, is that at this point or at the point that you got involved with the story, so much of the work has been done. How complicated by as far as the original investigation goes, that so much of that work has been done. How much more complicated is it now to get this to where it needs to be as a result of these prior it, whether we want to call them mistakes or omissions, like how much of uh, of a roadblock has that been? So I have an answer to that that is a little bit different than maybe you would expect. My, my sense of this case and what's missed, what hasn't come together at the end here, is that we were never trying to correct the police. Even though the Van Wicks at the time were, were circumspect about whether the police were actually actually cared about their daughter, whether they were diligent police officers, we approached our project as collaborative. So we wanted to do this. They wouldn't do it on their own. We asked them to reopen the case. They closed the case. Fair enough. So we, then the family took their own money, investigated this, and the idea was to present it as a collaborative piece. Between the Van Wicks and the... And police. the state. Yeah, yeah. The, the police, the prosecution service. And so the, yes, there were some holes. That wasn't an impediment. It, that was a, an opportunity. That's how mm-hmm. we saw it. So when we gathered this information, I, prov- I wrote my opinion, and then we took it to the, the police and ultimately to the prosecution service. The hope was that what they had privately man- managed to investigate could be put, layered on top of what the public had already investigated through the police, and that there was a viable prosecution there. Okay. So that, the goal wasn't to humiliate the police or to criticize the police. In the end, the police made their decision. Our job, our hope all the way through was to help the prosecution get information that could lead to a successful prosecution. Okay, I understand. 
And you, know, you, you mentioned uh, giving your opinion, your legal opinion. So as a lawyer, when you review a case, you would write a, a report similar to like what Tom had done, where you right. give a legal opinion. And who does that get presented to? Do you present that to the police? Well, what? funny enough, funny you asked that question. No one ever wanted to see it. Oh, so that's the that's part of the I think the, the confusion for the family. Okay. Um, they, in fact, the prosecution service has refused to review it, mm-hmm. um, and the police have refused to review it. So what I did is that on in August of 2020. Uh, shortly after um, I received Tom's report and provided a legal opinion to the family, we decided, okay, now it's time to present our findings to the state in the hope that they will simply run with it and prosecute this, mm-hmm. Mr. Potter. And so on August, I, I went, I drove down to the Bridgetown RCMP in person. I brought a, a copy of the report, that uh, Tom's report with me, and a copy of my opinion with me. Okay. And I met with uh, Sergeant Jamie Green of the RCMP. And I handed it over, and we sat in, in the, the Bridgetown Police Station with an appointment. And I tried to persuade him about why there was enough to run with here. And he told me that he was busy with a bunch of things. There had been a bunch of, I think, um, bunch of, there's, there's some high-profile policing issues down that way involving fishermen. Okay. And he said he was busy with, but likely someone would be assigned to the matter. And we know the Sergeant Terry Faulkner was assigned to the matter in the fall. Um, so I met with Sergeant Green for probably about an hour or two. I handed the materials off and I made myself available perpetually. Mm-hmm. Call me anytime. I asked if he wanted my legal opinion. He said, no, not right now. We want to review this with a clean slate and we'll get back to you. So then Sergeant Terry Faulkner took over the, the, the case sometime in the fall. And he said he was busy dealing with things, but he would get to it eventually. And I started probing in November and December with emails. Well, we, hadn't, we don't have a, an answer yet. You know, it's been three months. It's been four months. This is, a, this is a young girl's life. It's been a lot of expense for the family, and this is their access to justice. And ultimately, we, we are told that he uh, went to the local chief crown attorney, who's Ingrid Brody, mm-hmm. and asked her, uh, the police asked Ingrid to review the materials we presented and give a legal opinion. And we know um, from emails uh, that were exchanged between Ms. Brody and myself and the family that a prosecutor named Bill Ferguson, who was a senior prosecutor, himself had reviewed the material uh, that we had given the Bridgetown police. Mm-hmm. So we knew it made its way to the prosecution service. I offered again, repeatedly, to assist in their decision to prosecute. I offered my opinion, I offered to meet with them and go through the material, which I was very familiar with and they mm-hmm. wouldn't have been, because I've been doing the case for years at that yeah. point, and nobody took me up on it. In fact, they claimed that prosecutorial independence required that they not review my opinion, which I disagreed with. Okay. I told them in the email, that's not what prosecutorial independence is from my standpoint. The prosecutorial independence is independence from the police and from the government mm-hmm. so that they're not in- inappropriately influenced. There's a separate silo for policing and investigation and a separate silo for prosecution and the government can't influence either of those. There's supposed to be a separation where they have independence. Mm-hmm. But as far as a citizen coming forward to help with the prosecution, I was effectively an agent for the family of the deceased who they had retained to provide a legal opinion. There's no reason they couldn't have reviewed my opinion or the cases that I believe supported my opinion. And my opinion all along was that there was absolutely a case here to prosecute. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, I'm surprised to hear how collaborative and cooperative you were trying to be. I would have expected it to be more of an adversarial thing where my perception of it's completely different, but it seems almost as if they were not as interested in that as you maybe were open to. Yeah, I think they kept us at arm's length. I mean, I think there's they have their reasons, and you'd have to ask them, and I don't know if they would ever be prepared to be open about that. But mm-hmm. um, my advice to the family was not to take an adversarial approach because pointing fingers and blaming the police for, in their minds, not doing a thorough job on their daughter's investigation, that was something that caused them a lot of pain but was unlikely to get them anywhere if they were asking for help from the mm-hmm. state. So instead, we took this collaborative approach, and we, we developed our own case, we developed our own legal opinion, and we tried to give it to the state in, a hope, in the hope that they would then take it and run with it. Mm-hmm. And they shut us down. And if you, you've uh, done the research, put together your legal opinion, I'm, I'm expecting you to say you're con- you were confident in your legal opinion because of... Uh, you wouldn't have taken a collaborative approach if you weren't confident going in with something. Are you able to even just um, like kind of like Cole's notes summarize the legal opinion yeah. you gave? Yeah. So, um, and I'll, I'll just grab my opinion because yeah. I was looking at it today. 
in uh, if you can talk while you look at it, it if you can describe like a, a legal opinion so you would do research on a case in the legal opinion would just be you outlining what you think the case would be and citing like other similar cases that had you know that had similarities is that yeah so i'm looking i'm, I'm just having my opinion up here on the screen um so the opinion is uh, basically me putting together all the information that would be would have been presentable in court mm -hmm. i i was very clear with the family that i would review the material some material like the initial statements of mr potter to the police would likely have been inadmissible, so I wouldn't rely on those. Assuming those were excluded, what else is left? Mm -hmm. And based on the investigation of Tom Martin, I believe we could prove without a doubt, which is this criminal standard beyond a reasonable doubt, prove that Roland Potter was operating that tractor and that he was, for at least two minutes, in the clear knowledge that Sia Van Wick was chasing him around the field and that he posed a danger to her at all times. Mm -hmm. And he told investigators, I believe, um, that he was going to tell her to go home, but then lost track of her and assumed she had gone home mm -hmm. before ultimately running her over. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that the field that this took place on was smaller than a soccer field. Mm -hmm. And it was already half cut. And so when you think of the area of danger running concentric circles that get smaller on every pass, the area of danger gets small in every pass. And your attention is always focused inwards toward the area of danger as you run these circles. So she wouldn't have been in any of the danger areas when she came on the field, so she would have had to cross into it after he knew that she was on the field. So he lost track of her. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like he intended, there's no way to, there's no reason to believe he intended to hurt her. But criminal negligence is a crime that's available when one citizen owes a duty of care to another. And there's a case called Coin from 1958, which I put in my opinion, I also sent it to the Crown, that specific case. And I'll read the quote for what it's worth. Yeah. It's a 1958 case that adopted the following definition of duty for the criminal negligence. There is a duty tending to the preservation of life to take proper precautions in the use of dangerous weapons or things. It is the legal duty of everyone who does any act which without ordinary precautions is or may be dangerous to human life to employ those precautions in doing it. Which is to say, you don't have a right to walk down the street swinging the sword in a circle and if someone happens to get hit by the sword, well, that's their fault. You're swinging the sword, so you have to watch out for other people. And in the same way, the machine that Roland Potter was driving was objectively dangerous. Not only was it objectively dangerous, which is to say other people would say, see it as dangerous, he himself knew it was dangerous when he told the investigators that he was worried that Sia was on the field chasing him around because she shouldn't be there because he was a danger to her. So when you put that, so what we argued in our opinion, which the prosecution never saw, is that once he saw her on the field and recognized that he was a danger to her, the duty arose to protect her because he's doing something dangerous. It's obvious that the tractor poses a danger and it's obvious that she is the one who is likely to be harmed if you don't take precautions so when he fails to take precautions and fails to keep track of her and somehow she ends up in the area of danger and gets run over by her without him even noticing it has to be that he's failed in his duty of care to her mm -hmm. and the other piece of, in, of evidence that we would argue is that he claims that he ran over her and then didn't even notice and did a whole other pass around the field before seeing her body uh, left on the field in front of him. So he had run over her and done a whole other circle before he realized he'd done so. The experts that Tom had talked to had all said that when you hit anything that isn't grass, it feels different, it sounds different. Even if Sia hadn't made an, a scream, which we assume that she would have made some noise, the feeling of the mower it would have been different cutting through a human bone and body than it would be cutting through grass. So the idea that he didn't notice at that point that he hit her is also evidence that he wasn't paying good attention. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he wasn't meeting the duty of care required in law. And it was my opinion that with that information alone, you had a, valid pro a viable prosecution for criminal negligence causing death. Wow. So you go into this uh, at, with this report done with um, the goal of getting 
for the prosecution to consider like a criminal negligence case against Roland Potter, they don't look at your report and they never see the case you make. So how does it end and where is it at now? It's very sad uh, for the family. It was devastating and there was a lot of tears after um, we got the, their final edict. They were refusing to prosecute and they had come to the opinion independent of me without speaking to me or to the family that there wasn't a case to prosecute here, that there was no realistic prospect of conviction. So once we got that information, um, our there was nothing left to do legally. Um, there has been discussion about a private prosecution. Mm -hmm. And that was always a backup plan. Mm -hmm. And a private prosecution can be brought by in, in Canada by any citizen against another citizen. And you don't have to call the police to, to lay a prosecution technically. But the law in Canada requires that if a citizen goes to court and swears that their neighbor has done something wrong, that they have to give notice to the prosecution service mm -hmm. about the allegation and including all the information that they would have. The, the prosecution service has a veto right. So I'm allowed to charge anyone I want with anything, but the state can simply veto it if they don't think it's meritorious. Okay. So what we now know is that the prosecution has looked at everything we have and has decided, independent of our opinion, that there is no viable prosecution. And, and do they share their findings and decision making with you? No, in fact, again, they claimed solicitor client privilege. Okay. So they said that their legal opinion was shielded from our view. Now, of course, they could have waived it. The police could have waived it. And they could have provided us a copy. Of, um, and I could have still sent them mine, which they refused to, to read. But they don't know why I think there's a prosecution, and they won't tell me why they think there's no prosecution. Interesting. Yeah. Despite you being an open book. In, in I don't instance. know how it could have been more open in this case. Yeah. Well, um, with that being kind of like, if you go to f d the root of the private prosecution and they shut it down, you're done. So I guess that is your, your last kind of, um, the last avenue you'll turn to. What else, uh, without getting to that, what else are you pursuing? Like what other legal avenues do you have? Or what other work is being done? We've, we've considered what we believe to be our last possible public review of what's happened here. And that's a coroner's inquest. Mm -hmm. Now I know the family I think has made a, a complaint to the RCMP process and that may find its way through based on the police investigation, but that would only be critical of the police action or inaction mm -hmm. in relation to this investigation. But what is, what is possible and public and could hold everyone accountable is a coroner's inquest. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's being considered. Um, that would unlike, be unlikely to result in anyone finding that Roland Potter was legally responsible for Sia's death but would certainly be prepared to make findings about cause of death and talk about the process of investigating. Okay. And a coroner's inquest is something kind of comparable with like a public inquiry on yeah. a smaller scale? Precisely. Yeah. Okay. So the coroner would call it, a, once, the, once he determines, I think, that the death is a wrongful death of some kind, they have the power to call a, an inquest where there's a, a publicly funded and public inquiry into the entire event from the first involvement of the first responders, the day of Sia's injury and, and ultimate death uh, until probably the present day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the, like I know you've been working on this case for a long time. Uh, one of the questions I was going to ask is when the public should expect to see a development, but that seems impossible to guess at it this is, point. It is, it is, thanks. Yeah, so it's been, you know, almost two years, uh, to be two years in April when the prosecution gave us their final no. Mm -hmm. And as I understand you're aware from previous interviews with the Van Wyck family, that they had put a lot of hope in a Globe and Mail article that was published last summer. Mm -hmm. And they were hoping that it would come out in a way that was very supportive of our attempts to have the matter prosecuted and that that might lead to some kind of groundswell of support mm -hmm. um, for either an inquiry or for the Crown to reconsider the case or potentially to, to push to force them in a private prosecution scenario to allow the prosecution to go forward. And I know they were very disappointed with that article, and, and frankly, so was I. I don't think, I, th I think the reporter did her best to be even handed, um, but I don't think, I think this is a case that didn't, doesn't require an even hand. I think from our point of view, it's clear that uh, Mr. Potter did not take adequate care, uh, nor has he taken any functional responsibility for what happened to Sia. Mm -hmm. So the next steps, um, it's, it's 
We don't know. We, we, there's no clear line anymore. But once the prosecution service declined to prosecute, as far as public justice goes, there are very few avenues remaining. And now you wouldn't have taken this case if you weren't confident. You wouldn't have spent this much time on it if you weren't confident. How confident are you that the that the other side of this will eventually see it from your point of view? Well, and if they want to read my legal opinion, that may persuade them. But you know, there are senior lawyers who have come to a different opinion, and I've lost cases in court that I should have won and I've won cases that I probably should have lost. Mm. Um, I'm not confident that the state is listening. I don't, I'm not, I don't know if I would say that they're calloused and don't care. I don't think I'd go that far, but no one, no one in the, you know, in the policing apparatus or the prosecution apparatus has uh, shown a great interest in my point of view. You know, I, I know what you do happens generally in a courtroom, but for people who are listening to us who believe that there had been an injustice and want to support Sia's family in some way, as a lawyer representing their family, what can the public do to make your job and their job easier? I think they can write letters uh, to their local members of, of government, mm -hmm. uh, provincial and federal, and they can write to the prosecution service and say that they're aware that the prosecution has declined to lay charges in a case where there is still evidence that exists today that could be led today in a case against Mr. Potter. I want to thank you for joining James and I for our discussion surrounding justice for Sia Van Wick. James ended our talk with some instructions on how you could help advocate for Sia. If you feel compelled to help, please do. As well, if you want to organize your efforts, a good place to do that is in the Justice for Sia Facebook group. I've added a link to that group in this episode description. And with that, I'm going to end this episode, but before I do, I have some thanks. First, a big thanks to James Jack Antonio for sharing an evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. I'd like to thank LJ from the Dystopian Simulation podcast, who provides the intro and outro voiceovers. And a big shout out to Monty Data, who contributes the music for this episode. It's a piece called Noir Tokyo. And lastly, but most importantly, I have a massive thank you to everyone listening to Nighttime, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. And on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed. Kim, Nathan, and the Dark Canuck. Thank you for your generous support. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, you can help out in a variety of ways. A premium feed subscription costs a couple dollars a month and both funds the creation of the show and gives you access to an ad-free two-day early release and a full back catalog of episodes. And if you don't want to go premium, you can simply help the show by sharing the episodes on social media and letting like-minded friends know about the work we're doing here. If you have any story ideas, if you want to give feedback on the show, or if you'd like to submit a question or comment for an upcoming episode, you can reach me at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. I hope to hear from you. But until then, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and advocate for justice for Sia Van Wick. The Nighttime Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Jordan Bonaparte.